This video will introduce the concepts associated with the inverse Laplace transform. And this will be just a conceptual introduction. Uh, we've, we, in subsequent videos, we will go through much more information about the Laplace transform and how to invert it. So what I have here on the screen is a portion of a Laplace transform table that I've copied from Wikipedia. On the left-hand column, we have time functions. And in the right-hand column, we have their corresponding Laplace transform. If you look at this Laplace transform, or, or the, the uh, different uh, Laplace transforms that we have, most of them are ratios of two polynomials. So for example, this is a ratio of 1 over s to the n plus 1. This is a polynomial of order 0, a polynomial of order s, or of order n plus 1. 1 over s is a ratio of polynomials. 1 over s squared is a ratio of polynomials. 1 over s plus alpha to the n plus 1 is a ratio of polynomials. This would be an n plus first order polynomial. And so as you go through here, almost all of these Laplace transform terms are ratios of polynomials. So in this discussion of computing the inverse Laplace transform, we will limit ourselves to polynomials or ratios of polynomials. So I can write this as a numerator polynomial uh, divided by a divisor polynomial. Now clearly, there are some things that show up in our table. And if you look at the complete table, there's even more stuff that shows up in there that's not a ratio of polynomials. So our approach is going to be a little bit limited. Although quite often, if you look at the table, the things that show up that aren't ratios of polynomials involve delays in the time domain, which turn into an e to the minus tau s term that's added. So sometimes uh, you can actually factor out this delay, and then you'll have a ratio of polynomials again. So in any case, uh, we're going to look just at the ratio of polynomials. The approach that we're going that we will use, and this is a pretty standard approach, is the following. A and I'll give you I'll, I'll use an example throughout just to show how we might do this. So suppose I have this ratio of polynomials. And I want to take the inverse Laplace transform. My numerator polynomial is 1. My denominator polynomial is the denominator polynomial. If your memory is good, uh, you will remember that there was nothing in the uh, inverse Laplace or in the Laplace transform table on the Laplace transform column that has a polynomial that looks exactly like this, which means that I can't just look in the table and discover what the inverse Laplace transform is, which is sad, because if you could, it would make life a lot easier. So what we need to do is take this ratio of polynomials and break it into chunks of things where each chunk or each piece shows up as something in the inverse Laplace transform table. So we will show how to do that. We'll use a technique that is called partial fraction expansion. And partial fraction expansion is a way of taking this set of polynomials and breaking it into pieces where you have one piece for every root of the denominator polynomial. So just to remind you, 
the roots of a denominator polynomial, or the roots of any polynomial, are the values of s that make that polynomial 0. In our case, we also call these roots of the denominator polynomial poles because any value of s that makes the denominator 0 is going to make the whole ratio blow up. It goes off to infinity, essentially. And so we'll call them either roots of the denominator polynomial or poles. This denominator polynomial has roots of 0, minus 2, minus j. No, I've got that wrong. This is one of the things you have to do in order to find out what the roots are, is be able to factor a polynomial. And as I've demonstrated, that may not always be completely easy. No, actually, no, I had it right. OK, so minus 2 plus j minus 2 minus j. So I have a third order polynomial. It has three roots. You'll notice two of these roots are complex. I, rec or I represent these roots quite often in what's called a pole 0 plot. In this case, I'm only going to plot the poles, where I have complex numbers, so I look at their real and imaginary part. I have a pole at 0. That's this guy. I have a pole at minus 2 plus j. That's this guy. And I have a pole at minus 2 minus j. That's this guy. Okay. So again, these poles are important because every pole is going to give us a term in the partial fraction expansion of the ratio of polynomials. Each term is going to look something like this, where k1, this k1 is a constant. And the whole point of the partial fraction expansion is to find out what k1 is. Once you know what k1 is, then you can take an inverse Laplace transform of this piece of the partial fraction expansion. p1 is one of the poles. So in this case, we might call p1 this uh, 0. And so in this particular case, this is actually going to be k1 over s because uh, my pole here, my p1, is equal to 0. This, I recognize it immediately from the Laplace transform table, transforms to k1 u of t, or inverse transforms to k1 u of t. So you can see that if I knew what this k1 was, I would be able to uh, do the inverse Laplace transform of this term, and everything would be great. So the partial fraction expansion, the basic problem that you face there is computing these constants. And again, in this video, we will not do that, but we will do that in a subsequent video. The next pole that I have, the minus 2 plus j, I'll represent as k2 over, uh, let's see, s. Well, uh, we're getting ourselves a little messed up here. Let's try this again k2 over s minus p2. Now, in this case, p2 is this pole minus 2 plus j. So this term is going to look like k2 over s plus 2 minus j. Now, if you go back to the Laplace transform table, you will not see a uh, entry that looks exactly like this in the sense that you have some constant over s plus a complex valued constant. Uh, it turns out that you can still 
uh, take the inverse time or inverse transform of this fairly easily, but you get something that's kind of messy in the time domain. So we're going to we will look a little harder at this and figure out how to avoid the mess when you go back to the time domain. And finally, we have k3 over s minus p3. And this is p3, just to make sure it's sure, or that it's clear, this was p2. And so I'll have a k3 over s plus 2 minus j, or plus j, whoops. So you can see that I've broken my ratio of polynomials into three terms, k1 over s, k2 over s plus 2 minus j, and k3 over s plus 2 plus j. And each of these terms corresponds to one of the poles, which again is one of the roots of the denominator polynomial. Now, before we actually start talking about how to perform this partial fraction expansion, uh, we need to talk about what it means when I've got these complex poles and how that might affect my partial fraction expansion. We will do that in the next video.